couple of months ago, and the children love um, their uh, place, not PlayStation, what is it, the one that has Mario Kart, Nintendo, is it? Switch, it's a Switch, they're Nathan Kellen knows his way around, ca- and as you can see, I don't know my way around um, consoles, and the children were very, very keen, you know, do you want to play Mario Kart? And I didn't really want to, but they really, really wanted me to. So um, we did a whole, um, a whole race, and even by the end of the race, I still hadn't even worked out which of the four cars on the screen was actually my car. <laughs> the, the relationship between my steering and the movement of the things was so sort of um, completely uncoordinated. I didn't know who I was. And so the whole thing was basically a complete mystery to me for the whole thing. And I think Amos can be a bit like that. You, you read the whole chapter, and you don't quite know who we are or where we fit in. So I thought I'd just start there, and it's going to help us with the whole series. So this is a a prophecy um, by a bloke from the south, so Amos is a southerner, against the people in the north. Now, I know in lots of countries there's a sort of north-south divide, and, you know, we're all, well, not all southerners. Have we got any northerners here? We've got people from all sorts of different countries, but Rob Cavanagh is a northerner. So I actually lived briefly in the north of England. Um, and I think, um, you know, people have attitudes towards the other part of the country. I know it's the same in Germany and the same in France. You have sort of, and the same in Italy. There's lots of north-south divides, maybe in your country as well. But in, um, in God's country, in the, um, the people of God in the Old Testament, there's quite a significant north-south divide. And it's not just a divide of sort of culture and um, whether you pronounce your, um, your A's short or long. You know, do you say bath or bath or... Um, it's more significant than that. It's a, it's a religious divide. Because in Amos's day, the people up north have gone astray. Sorry about this, Rob. Um, they've gone off spiritually. And they got a different king up in the north. Uh, his name is Jeroboam II. It's a kind of an ominous name because Jeroboam I, his namesake, he was the king who set up um, altars to golden calves. Um, up at Dan and Bethel. Um, He made idols for the people to worship. Now, lots of us were um, in the book of Exodus this week uh, looking at the first golden calf that the people of Israel made back in the time of Moses and Aaron. And it didn't go very well. Well, God was very angry about this golden calf. But now, um, Jeroboam sort of doubles it. He makes two golden calves and leads the people um, to idolatry. And he sets up, along with golden calves, he sets up his own priesthood, um, he sets up his own religious festivals, um, he basically makes up his own religion. Except it kind of looks a bit like real religion. It looks a bit like Christianity. Um, so they still call their God the Lord, the Yahweh. Uh, they still talk about and God rescuing them uh, through the Exodus. It's just they've kind of changed it a bit around the edges. It's kind of religion on their own terms, um, their own way. And Amos, from the south, down south things are a bit better. People um, still worship at the temple, as they're supposed to. Uh, They still worship through the Levites, the priests that God had ordained. They still keep the festivals that God had chosen. So up north, a kind of DIY, do-it-your-own-way religion down south a little bit truer to the Bible. And Amos is a bloke from down south, and he's been sent up north to tell them what God thinks of them. Um, And I put here on the the, the sheet, Amos is Israel. So the the land up north is called Israel, and the land down south where Amos is from is called Judah. And he basically says, Israel, you're in all sorts of trouble. You are a fake church. You know, you, you look like you're really God's people, but you're not. You've gone way, way astray from worshipping the true God, even though you kind of keep the outward appearance of looking like a church. Um, now, okay, that's still a long time ago. So, um, you know, two and a half thousand years ago, there was this place up north called Israel where they were fake. Okay, what does that have to do with us? Well, in the New Testament, you remember we were looking at Acts um, uh, a little while ago on Sundays, And we saw Stephen, the first Christian martyr, he says to all of the the religious leaders of his day, you're all a fake church, you're all not the real thing. And he quotes Amos to them. 
He says, you look like you're the people of God, but you're not really the people of God because you've rejected Jesus and so you're fake. Yeah, you've got a temple and you've got you know, Jewish practices, but you're not the real thing. Okay, so that takes us from Amos' day into the New Testament time. Um, and, but we might still be thinking, okay, but that's okay because I'm not even Jewish at all. I'm not from the north of Israel. I'm not even from Israel. I'm, I'm not the person that Amos was talking to. I'm not the person that Steve was talking to. So I can let myself off the hook. And I just put that one last verse there. And I got the reference wrong. I'm sorry. It should say Romans 11, chapter 20 and 21. And Romans 11 just warns us. It says, you who are Gentiles in the Christian church, which is most of us, make sure you don't make the same mistake as the fake Israelites did. So they got it wrong, and God turned his back on them. Make sure you don't do the same. And so I think that means that even though you know, it's a specific people where things got specifically bad, it kind of is a warning that we need to tune into today. But in particular, it's a warning that is going to apply to areas of the church which have gone a long, long way away from God. And they might still look like a church, um, and they might still have services on Sundays, but what they actually do in church is religion their own way. Um, and what they believe in church is, is the kind of a, a mixture between things God says and things that they've said. Um, and it's not really the real thing. Um, actually, that, I think that is very common around the world today. So um, I always worry if, if one of my friends who's not a Christian suddenly wants to go to church, which is uh, brilliant, and they just choose the church at the end of their road. They just pick the, the nearest building that looks like a church. And I think, oh no, because what if it's not a real church? What if it's a fake church? Because they look the same, and they've got the same, well, this one doesn't even look like one, does it, traditionally? It's just, a, we're in a naval college in a lecture theatre. But, you know, you pick something with a church building kind of look to it, or something that calls itself something church Greenwich, and you think, oh, I'll go there. But what if it's not the real thing? Uh, there is such a thing as a fake church. And um, Amos is against that, and we're going to see how dangerous it is as we go through um, these chapters. Now, the thing that is most obviously wrong in Israel is that instead of worshipping God, they worship golden calves. You know, they're, they're just breaking the second commandment. They're, they're idolaters. They've made up their own kind of religion. It's like a kind of cult, really. That's the thing that's most obviously wrong. But it's not the thing that Amos goes for. He doesn't go with what's wrong with their religion straight away. Instead, he goes, what's wrong with their treatment of each other? Their treatment of the vulnerable. And I want to show you that, and then I'll explain why. So um, this is how you know that they're fake. So just look down at the sheets, verse 6. For three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because... They sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. Um, it, it could be sell as in sell out. You know, if, if there's a profit to be made, they don't care what the casualties are. So here is the poor, here are the people at the bottom of the, of, of the pile. And just without hesitation, if they can make a quick buck, they'll sell them out. Or, or maybe it means they'll literally sell them. You know, there's a, there's a tiny debt. Someone owes you the price for a, of a pair of sandals. And they say, well, for that, we're going to demand that you go into slavery to pay it back. Just, you know, just a few pounds. And they force people into slavery. Verse 7, they trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth. It's quite a brutal image, isn't it? Um, they oppress people. They trample people. I was in um, Berlin recently, and I went to the, the Jewish Museum which has a, um, a big art installation in memory of the Holocaust. And it's quite a horrific thing because they've, I mean, it's very effective, but they've got a load of human faces that they make out of metal and they fill the whole of the, this room with these human faces. And then as you walk through the room, you, you crunch on them, you trample on them. And it, you know, it's, I mean, it's an amazing art installation because it is really grotesque to, 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 to hear the sounds. And it made me think of this. They trample the head of the poor into the dust and turn aside the way of the afflicted. You see, those who are vulnerable in society 
are the casualties. A man and his father go into the same girl. So that they're sexually immoral. They sleep with whoever they want. But again, you kind of see the casualties of it. And I guess all sexual immorality has casualties. There's people who get hurt uh, in the porn industry or in prostitution. Um, and here you kind of get the sense that you not only is it against what God's plan is for sex, but people get hurt. This girl is you know, passed around different men in the same family. Verse 8, they lay themselves down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge and in the house of their God. Notice that. Not my house, says God, in the house of their God, their religion that they think is the real thing. They lay down on garments taken in pledge. They drink the, the wine of those who've been fined. Now, um, you know, there were, within the Jewish law, legitimate times when you would take someone's property, either as a down payment um, for a loan or as a fine or as a penalty. But it's like they're sort of fining people just for fun. So, you know, they see somebody with a nice wine cellar and they think, oh, I'll fine him. And then now we've got the wine cellar. You know, it, they've got sort of exploiting their powers to confiscate stuff just so they can enjoy it. It's like the police force, basically, of just stealing stuff off people. And they've got such low moral scruples that they then enjoy all those things they've stolen in church. Because their religion kind of allows this kind of thing. Because it's not the real thing. It's a fake religion. Uh, the false, The fake church oppresses the vulnerable. Now, um, why does Amos go for that straight away? Why doesn't he say, I've got a problem with your golden calves, which God does. Um, I've got a problem with your fake priests and your fake festivals, wh which God does. Why does he go for this? I think it's because this is the thing that is just glaringly obvious to everyone. And we actually had the same logic. Some of us uh, yesterday were at a training morning um, uh, on Saturday morning. We were looking at the book of Titus. And Titus does the same thing. He said, if, if you want to know who to appoint as leaders in your church, don't just give people a, a doctrine test, say, what do you believe? But look at how they treat people. Um, I mean, doctrine really matters. But the way to find out what someone's doctrine is is to look at how they treat people. Um, and if they abuse people, and if they're quick-tempered and angry, and they're not hospitable, and they, they're after people's money, well, then they probably don't believe the truth. Or, or Jesus said the same thing, didn't he? He said that um, you can tell a tree by its fruit. You go, oh, I wonder what kind of tree this is. I wonder if this is an apple tree or a thorn bush. And Jesus, well, the easiest way to find out if it's an apple tree or a thorn bush is see whether it grows apples or whether it grows thorns. You know, look at the fruit of the tree and you can see what kind of tree it is. Look at the, the symptoms of this religion. And Amos says this fake religion, you can tell it a mile away because it oppresses people. It's a good test, isn't it, of the, the health of a church. Is How does this church deal with the most vulnerable in its midst? How are the people uh, on the margins treated, protected, or exploited. That's how you can tell. In fact, that is how everyone can tell. Look down at verse 9, of course, in chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 9. Proclaim to the strongholds in Ashdod, to the strongholds in the land of Egypt, and say, assemble yourselves on the mountains of Samaria, and See the great tumults within her and the oppressed in her midst. They don't know how to do right, declares the Lord. Those who store up violence and robbery in their strongholds. Now, and what's going on here is um, Ashdod and Egypt are basically enemies. They're traditionally enemies of Israel. And actually in chapter 1, we saw last week, God has it in for Ashdod for their own brutality. But now the people who were in the dock... Ashdod and Egypt, are invited into the public gallery to watch the prosecution of Israel. So God, God kind of calls to their oppressors and says, check out what they're up to. 
Uh, this is stuff that is so shocking that even Ashdod and Egypt are shocked by it. Uh, even God's enemies are shocked by the evil that goes on within the fake church. Look at the, the oppressed in her midst. They do not know how to do right, declares the Lord. Now this is um, key, isn't it? Because the outsider, the enemy, they're not very theologically aware. If you are, they're not, they're not, these aren't Christians from Egypt or from Astra. They don't know the, the proper ways of the Bible. So you can't ask them to assess for Israel theologically. They're just not going to know the difference between whether it's okay to worship golden calves and whether it's okay to worship God. But even Egyptians know oppression when they see it. And they can recognize that. It, it's like kind of where, yeah, uh, the, the watching church, looking on, the watching world are looking on the church. They, they don't know all the ins and outs of theology. But they do know child abuse when they read about it in the papers. Uh, they do know um, financial swindling uh, when they read about that. You see, it's a scandal that is just obvious to everyone that says something is terribly wrong. Um, how do we treat those who are vulnerable and those who are marginalized? Now, um, I, I put they, the faith church of President Vandal, they, their heritage, their warnings, rather than our heritage and our warnings. And I, I was just in two minds about this, because I don't think, or I hope this isn't us. I think there are, you know, great signs at Grace Church that people care for the vulnerable. Um, and um, I've just seen examples of that just in the, even the last uh, 24 hours. Um, somebody had to go to hospital and someone took them and waited um, for hours outside to see how they were. Um, we, we heard about the fellowship fund, you know, people giving their money to, to help others in the church who are in financial pressure. Um, th th yeah, there's a lot of generosity in Grace Church Greenwich. Maybe you, um, it's invisible or... We don't always notice it, but there's lots of care for each other here. And I think that's right. You know, Jesus said you'll recognize Christians by their love for one another. And we ought to be able to see that. And if there's no love for each other, and if there's no love for the vulnerable, then it's fake. Now, I, I, I think Grace Church does well on that test, but we've got to ask the question. I mean, it, you know, this, isn't, this is about the, the fake up north false church. I don't think that's us, but... Let's beware, let's hear the warning. Let, let's ask ourselves the question, how do we treat those on the fringes, on the margins? It's a test of spiritual health. But here is a church that fails on the social question, on the vulnerable question. Now, this is the problem I had when I was trying to apply this. I was thinking, the weird thing about nowadays, in the 21st century, is sometimes the churches that care least about the Bible seem to care most about the poor. And that's just, it's just a tricky thing, isn't it? Because here, Amos is saying, they don't care about the Bible, they don't care about worshipping God rightly, and therefore they don't care about the poor. Um, but what are we supposed to do with the, the church that, well, they, they've departed from Christian sexual ethics, but they run a soup kitchen. Um, or they don't care what the Bible says about worshipping only one God. Um, uh, and yet they um, run relief work um, I for Oxfam. Yeah, th it seems to be that people who really aren't that concerned about God are quite concerned for other people. What, what are we to do with that? And I was just puzzling about that. And I, I was thinking, I don't know if this helps, but I was thinking that just as in Amos's day, there's a kind of fake religion that gives people self false security. Yeah, they're, they're not worshipping the tree god, but they're very busy in their golden calf shrines doing religious stuff. So I wonder if in, in our day there's a kind of fake social conscience that actually masks the real thing. Um, it, it, there's a kind of social conscience on our terms that actually is still quite oppressive. Um, so, um, for example, and this is, where it's, this is the controversial bit of the sermon that I was sort of scared to say on a recording. But this is a bit, the bit where, for example, our country's ideology about trans stuff um, could be very oppressive in the, in the name of being very liberated. Um, you know, here's a teenager who's confused about their gender identity. Um, here's a society that's ready to um, give the teenager drugs 
or, or a little bit later surgery um, uh, in a way that the, the Bible warns is very damaging to somebody. Um, uh, or um, in the name of um, choice for a woman uh, might come death for a, an unborn baby. Um, in the name of being liberated, you know, we are pro uh, the freedom of women, whereas at the same time we're anti the safety of an unborn child. And there's lots of ways where we can, actually, ironically, we have a kind of fake morality where we congratulate ourselves, look how much we care about the vulnerable at the same time as we oppress the vulnerable. Just like, look how much we care about being religious at the same time as they oppress what is religious. The fake church oppresses the vulnerable. And then there's a couple of ways that makes it even worse. They do this despite their great spiritual heritage. You know, when you see that um, people working for Oxfam in Haiti, and then it turns out there's been mass exploitation of people in the name of something that was meant to be an aid organization. It's very shocking. But what Amos is describing is more shocking. Because these are meant to be God's people. Just look at verse 9. Yet it was I who brought them safely into the promised land. Verse 10. Um, It was I who brought you up out the land of Egypt at the Exodus. Verse 11, I who raised up some of your sons for prophets. You know, you, you went fake even though I, even though I, I saved you. I gave you a promised land. I gave you my word. And I gave you all these things. But you, look at how you trample the poor and crush the needy. Um, despite this great spiritual heritage, verse chapter 3, verse 1, hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O people of Israel, against the whole family of the I brought up out of the land of Egypt. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for your iniquities. Now, you, you who were saved out of Egypt, you who saw the the waters of the Red Sea parted. You who were fed with manna in the wilderness. You who came up Mount Sinai and received my You know, such privileges you had. And yet you have turned away from me. It's just extra bad. There's oppression all over the world, isn't there? There's oppression all over the UK. But it's extra bad when it's under the umbrella of someone who's supposed to be the church or the people of God. The fake church oppresses the vulnerable despite their great spiritual heritage. And then just despite the warnings that they don't want to hear. This is the other thing that characterizes the the fake church. Uh, They've got fake religion. um, They've got a fake care for the oppressed. Um, But the other thing that characterizes them is that they will not listen to what God says. Um, The the Bible is closed or is only read very selectively. In, in the fake church. You, you can see this in um, verse uh, 11, chapter 2, verse 11. God says, I raised up some of your sons for prophets um, and some of your young men for Nazarites. Isn't it so, people of Israel, declares the Lord? But you made the Nazarites drink wine and commanded the prophets, saying, you shall not prophesy. Um, Nazarites were people who took a special vow that they wouldn't cut their hair and that they wouldn't drink. In order to serve the Lord, obviously I haven't taken at least one of those vows. But, um, uh, but they sort of despise that and they, they, they trick the Nazarites into getting drunk. Um, and the prophets who come to bring God's word, they say, shut up. Do not prophesy. We do not want to hear your sermon, Amos or Amos' friends. They won't listen. But God says, yeah, but you are going to listen. Yeah, you don't want to hear this. It's uncomfortable. That uh, Here's the church that's, that's drifted off so far that they don't really want to hear the Bible anymore. But Amos says, but you are going to hear it. Chapter 3, verse 1. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, people of Israel, against the whole family I brought out of Egypt. We don't want to hear, they say. We don't want to hear. And then um, let me take you to verse 3 to 8. Just look at chapter 3. Three, verse 3. Do two walk together unless they've agreed to meet? 
Does a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? Does a young lion cry out from his den if he's taken nothing? Does a bird fall in a snare on the earth when there's no trap? Does a snare spring up from the ground when it's taken nothing? Is a trumpet blown and people aren't afraid? Does disaster come and the Lord has not done it? Th- this really confused me, I have to say. Many times I read it, I thought, what is going on here? I think if you were to do it in English, you'd just say, is there smoke without fire? That's, that's the idea. You, you don't have the outcome unless something caused it. So um, do two people walk along the street together if they didn't meet up? Well, no. I mean, by definition, if they're walking together and they met each other before they started walking down the road. Does a lion roar when he has no prey? I mean, no, lions don't do that. They roar with victory over the prey that they've killed. Um, does a bo- bird fall in a snare if there's not a snare? I mean, it's these kind of obvious questions, don't they? Can a bird fall in a snare without there being a snare? Like, no. It's like saying, can a mouse get trapped in a mouse trap without the mouse trap? It's like, obviously not, right? So it's just, there's always going to be a cause for this. Something doesn't happen without a cause. Well, then verse 8, the lion has roared, who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken, who can but prophesy? Amos is saying, you don't really want to hear this message, but I've got to tell you this message because God spoke it. No smoke without fire. Uh, no book of Amos without God speaking to Amos. That's what he's saying. The, the, reason I'm get, the reason this bloke from the south has come up and, and told you people in the north stuff you don't want to hear is because God spoke to me and I've just got to tell you. Um, God has caused this word to come and you've got to listen. You know, Because the, the truth is, and this is I think why it's so key, that God isn't okay with people just making up fake religion. But the place where fake religion comes face to face with the true thing is in God's word. Because yeah, they're making up their own religion up north. But God wants to tell them what he thinks about it. And when we open the Bible, and that's, that's why at Grace Church Greenwich, we, we try to go through whole books of the Bible. It's why we're doing the book of Amos. You may have never read it before. And we're looking at every single chapter of the book of Amos. And I've never preached before, ever, on Amos chapter 2 and 3. But last week was chapter 1, and next week's going to be chapter 4. We're going to see the whole thing. Because when we open God's word, we hear what God thinks about it. And Amos says, there wouldn't be a word from me unless God had spoken. And God wouldn't have spoken unless he had a judgment to warn about. Does the lion roar without a, um, a prey? Does a young lion cry out without taking something? Well, verse 8, the lion has roared. You know, God is roaring like a lion. We saw that last week. That means you're in great trouble. His judgment's coming. He, his jaws are closing around you. And this is what this word's about. God will judge, destroy the fake church. Well, what does this mean um, for us? I guess um, make sure that we're not the fake church. It's the first thing to say. Yeah, it's, not, it's not like God celebrates all religion. He doesn't say, oh great, you know, you, you stuck a, a sign outside saying something church Greenwich. And I'm really happy with what you've done because I, I just like people who are religious. No, God says, is, is it the real thing? Is it, is it real religion? And you can tell because how do they treat the vulnerable ones? And do they listen to what I say about how to treat the vulnerable ones? You know, when, when my word says something difficult, do they listen to it? Or do they say, shut up, Amos, go back down south, we don't want you here. Um, Is it the real thing? Um, That'll be a question. Um, The the second thing, I guess it'll be a kind of, and maybe we can be a bit naive. You know, do you think that every church in London is a real church? Um, Or do you think that every part of the Church of England is the real church because it's the Church of England? Because God says not every part of Israel is the real church. They were fakes. And you could tell because of the way they treated the vulnerable. Uh, you could tell because of the way they responded to God's word. And it's extra shocking if in the name of the church this goes on. Like what happened in Haiti was bad. 
But what happens in the Church of England is much worse. Because such great privileges, it was I who saved you. It was I who gave you the promised land. It was I who spoke to you in my word, says God. And yet, this is what you've done. So now the lion roars. And then verse 12. Thus says the Lord, as the shepherd rescues from the mouth of the lion two legs or a piece of an ear, so shall the people of Israel who dwell in Samaria be rescued with the corner of a couch and part of a bed. Um, I've, I've heard um, someone trying to read this in a sort of glass half full way. You know, well, you know, something's left. You know, we, God doesn't destroy everything. I don't think that's the image. You know, if, if you arrive just after the lion's breakfast, and all you find is two legs and part of an ear, that is not really rescuing the, the prey. You know, that is too late. Uh, and you get to Israel after God has dealt with them, and you find a corner of a couch and part of a bed. And, and this is what happened, actually. I mean, Israel gets wiped off the map in a few years' time. Uh, the Assyrian army comes and destroys them because God's had enough of them. He said, you're fake. And, and Stephen made the same warning to the, to the Jewish people of his day, saying, you've rejected the Messiah, and beware, you're fake. And then in AD 70, the temple was destroyed, and uh, many of those people were wiped out. And then Paul says to us in Romans, make sure you Gentile Christians don't make the same mistake. Um, there is a fake church. You can tell by how they treat the most vulnerable and how they respond to God's word. And God will destroy it. We're going to take a pause and then press. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God who is faithful, just, glorious, and righteous. We thank you that your works and ways attest to your character. We thank you that your word is relevant and true, and even passages like this, as hard as it may be to hear, speak to us. Please be at work by your spirit convicting us according to what we've heard from you this morning. Lord, please guard us from being a fake Christian or collectively from being a fake church. Help us heed your warnings. Give us ears that hear your word and protect us from being hard-hearted and having closed ears to your voice. Please cultivate in each one of us a care and love for the vulnerable in our church. Equip us all to reflect on our spiritual well-being and treatment of the vulnerable, where changes need to be made individually or corporately as a church. May you guide and help us to make those changes. May we respond accordingly in your timing to the ways in which you might be transforming us. Make us a humble church who fear you rightly, we pray. May we be a church known for our love for you and for one another. We pray for the vulnerable and those oppressed in our world. As UNICEF have released new figures of girls predicted to be brides in the next decades, 110 million made worse because of the pandemic. We commit the injustice of child marriage to you, Lord, and pray for this harmful practice to be ended for vulnerable gir girls globally. We pray for girls at risk of child marriage. May you, Lord God, protect them and may their rights be recognized. For organizations, teams and individuals working relentlessly to protect children and educate communities about the harm of child marriage, may their work be effective 
and transformative. Father, as we have heard in our notices, the cost of living is set to soar across our country and our world. Jesus reminds us that we will always have the poor, but we have heard this morning the encouragement to care and look out for the vulnerable and poor. So we pray for people in our community here in Greenwich, Hither Green, Deptford, Woolwich, wherever you have placed us. People who cannot afford basic necessities like a cooker, a bed, or even essential food for their families. Please, Lord, use us to love our neighbours as we seek to love you with all our hearts, minds, soul and strength. May we be ready to hold out the hope that we have in Jesus to our neighbours, the saviour that we all need. Finally, Father, we pray for the changes coming up in our church over the summer. We thank you for Paolo, James and Immy and the privilege it has been to be equipped in your word alongside them. Thank you, Lord, for the blessings and opportunities you have provided for them. We pray for Paolo as he prepares to go back to Portugal to marry Patricia and to take up a new role in his church. And for James and Immy and Daisy as they prepare to welcome a new member into their family next month and also move to Windsor for this new role for James. Please help them to prepare for these changes and transition well. We thank you for the ways in which you've provided for our church. We pray for Carolina, Tom, Johnny and Julia as they prepare to join us in September. Thank you, Lord, that you are preparing the works of their hands. Help us to prepare well for them and look forward to serving in ministry alongside them. We pray even now that they would settle into our church family well. May you provide for their needs over the coming weeks. We pray especially for each of them that they will find a home which will assist them in their service of you. And we pray for wisdom as the interviews for the church manager take place. May we depend upon you to provide and guide this process. We pray all of these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks, Jana. Thanks, Angie. I'm going to invite Angie back up because we've got a bit of time for questions. Um, and Angie's put some questions for us uh, down for us to reflect on, uh, but we've got an opportunity to ask him some questions as well. Um, there's a number um, here which if you text questions to, it will be anonymized, so I get it.